Halo Daybreak, Chapter 1, February 4th, 2550, Human Colony World, Trya. Trya was unlike any world the Ensign had been or seen since Onyx. A unique world, still young in the cosmic scheme of planetary growth, the atmosphere of the planet had a strong aurora element that meant that the planet was constantly surrounded by a cloud of aurora light, likely a result of the unique solar rays that refracted off the planet's new atmosphere that was established in part by the terraforming used to make the planet inhabitable. The planet was also unique in that it rotates on its axis slower than Earth does, making the days and nights far longer than what Earth is used to. It took years of preparation, practice, and patience to hope to live a prosperous life on Trya. But even if one were to settle on the planet, life could be harsh. Certain outlying plateaus near ocean zones in the Arctic territories were considered danger zones, as the weather patterns and sudden monsoon seasons could make living near them near impossible. But not only this, as the planet was still in its youth, the crust on certain areas of the planet were rather unstable, meaning volcanic activity was incredibly common and dangerous. Human settlements were forced to be built far from each other in key pocket locations that were safe. With a planet this unstable and dangerous, even after terraforming, it was a mystery to the ensign why even bother. But her reports on the planet's geology answered that question easily enough. As the planet was still young, the volcanic activity of the planet meant that the planet was abundant in iron and titanium deposits, only dwarfed by Reach herself in terms of titanium accessibility. The possibilities of such a planet were quite large, and so the UNSC had made Trya colonization a priority, even if there were risks involved. The Ensign had been briefed on all this before making planet fall. Now she re-listened to all the information as she pretended to sleep on the bouncy warthog ride out to military outpost Charlie. Are you listening to me? A thick Irish voice spoke in the ensign's ear. She opened her eyes to look out of the visor of her helmet and stare out at the mountain range ahead of her. It was the middle of the night, and she wanted to rest before arriving at the outpost, though that didn't seem likely at this point. The voice was coming from her own helmet, and had been droning on for what felt like hours. I've been listening, Wesk, she answered back sleepily. Good? I didn't dig up this data for you to catch your beauty sleep while I retell it, the voice replied coldly. The ensign smirked to herself. You're smiling, aren't you? Good guess. You know, that attitude is what put you here in the first place, Wisk growled. The smirk vanished immediately. I'd rather you not bring that up right now, she remarked. As you wish, Wisk answered obediently. But pretending the operation never happened isn't going to help mend the wounds. What's the point in mending a wound on a corpse, she retorted, silencing Wisk. Like I said, let's not bring that up right now. She sat up in her seat and looked at the Marine driving the warthog. He could hear her voice, though he couldn't hear Whisk. Whisk wasn't tuned into any other frequency other than her helmet. Whisk was an AI, a specifically designed and experimental artificial intelligence meant to assist the ensign in her operations and rehabilitation. Whisk was a valuable source of information, but a bit gruff for what she was used to in an AI. How far from the outpost? the ensign asked. Another three kilos, ma'am, the marine answered. We passed the watchtower a few kilos back, so we should be able to have visual confirmation in a minute. The ensign took off her helmet to let her auburn hair flutter slightly. It was cut close, just to her neck, and it waved like a banner in the oncoming and brisk wind. It was chilly here, the air feeling somewhere in the low 50s Fahrenheit. This plateau, where the outpost was located, was to be her home for the next five months, or until redeployment, so she better get used to it. She also knew this was a more temperate part of the planet, so temperatures were likely not going to get much better or worse than this. The Marine dared to glance up at her from behind the driver's seat. Um, if I may speak freely, ma'am, go ahead. It's just, uh, why don't you take a bird over here? The outpost has an operational hangar and landing pad. You know, I felt like bouncing my ass up and down the road. Keep me awake, the ensign teased back. That wasn't the reason, of course. The ride had been very uncomfortable and irritating, but it had been Whisk's suggestion to take a land vehicle to better acclimate herself with the terrain. After all, she was a stranger on Trya, and to be operational and prepared for any contingency... Knowing the land was essential. Why she couldn't pick up that intel from the air was a mystery to her, but that's why Whisk was there in the first place, to answer those questions. Despite that, she had to admit the view during the ride had been nice. The trees on trial were taller than on Onyx, and not nearly as dense. You could see through the gaps in the trunks to the sky beyond and behold the strange but wondrous colors of the aurora atmosphere. Clouds lazily sailed across the sky, breaking sight with the colors for only mere moments at a time. The ground was patched with grass, rock, and a material jutting out of the soil that the locals referred to as neocorts, a crystal that the locals used as a substitute for glass, easily melted down and refashioned into crystal-like objects. 
not of much material value on this world, but a resource all the same. Supposedly it was similar to obsidian, sharp, durable, fashionable into other functions. The difference was that obsidian was black in color typically, while neocorts was gold or white in hue. There were a few small woodland animals that scurried around, rabbits, squirrels, and raccoons, obviously, but also some reptilian toad-like creatures with three eyes the locals called Krugs, and a small flock of birds that the ensign couldn't remember the name of. They were all fine distraction from Whisk's boring monologue. Though, now she was beginning to regret ignoring him, as perhaps he would have prepared her for the sight of the outpost just ahead. There it is, ma'am. Outpost Charlie, the Marine announced. Just up ahead, beyond the horizon, was a small mass of small, single, and second-story buildings. Three towers jutted up near the rear of the complex with satellite and communications arrays. There were at least two airship docked around the facility, and a large open space for heavy-duty vehicles to move in and out. The closer they came to it, the more open the area felt, as if the trees were bending and giving way to open fields to let the warthog come closer. And at last, the ensign began to feel a bit nervous. She slid her helmet back on to hide the anxiety in her face. Even the Marine gulped a little, but said nothing until he finally brought the vehicle to a stop. The smell of gasoline and polisher filled the air, and the ensign could make out the aroma even through her helmet. She climbed out of her car and stepped down. "'Good driving with you, Spartan,' the Marine called out. "'Take care,' the ensign called back. She was a Spartan, an elite super soldier created to be the defender of humanity, along with all of her brothers and sisters in the program. As a Spartan, she was taller than most humans, but... What's more, she was physically stronger, faster, and more acutely aware of her surroundings, possessing heightened senses, reflexes, and tactical knowledge than the average soldier. There was a time she might have let that go to her head, let that knowledge compromise her. But now she couldn't let it. Not anymore. It's easy to believe yourself a god when you stand alone among mortals, but when among the pantheon, you're just another soldier in nice armor. And that was what she was here to do. Meet the pantheon she was joining. She marched like a frightened child on her first day at school. She was walking forward, but her armor felt oddly heavy. Her legs felt like they were hesitating to move. She could see the large hangar doors open and a pelican inside waiting for orders to take off. Leaning against the pelican were a few flight crew members, laughing and cutting jokes. At the sight of her green armor, they suddenly went quiet and straightened up. She nodded at them and approached the hangar. Uh, how can we help you, ma'am? One of the flight crew asked nervously. I'm looking for a saber, Commander. Oh, Commander Tyson, he's, um, in there. The flight crewman pointed behind the ensign to a pair of double doors that led further into the base and out of the hangar. She nodded to the crewman and hurried inside. Once indoors, she saw a small briefing room with a projector screen up, showing a map of a small ravine. In front of the projector was another Spartan like her, wearing gray and silver Mjolnir armor. He was pointing to something on the screen when he noticed her and paused. There were four other Spartans seated around the room as well, all turning to see her enter. The one by the projector was tall, brown-haired and solid, with dark eyes gazing at her, a long scar running down his left eye. Sitting in a chair to his right was a woman with long white hair, deep blue eyes like an ocean on onyx and blue armor. Another one still wore his helmet. He had on more aqua-colored armor and an orange visor hit his face. His arms were crossed over his chest, and he had his feet propped up. The fourth one was leaning against a wall, fiddling with some kind of small circular object that looked suspiciously like a grenade. He too had on his helmet, which hit his face. But he stopped his work to look up at her. She must have caught his attention. The last one was black with deep red eyes that looked rather fitting on his face. His hair was close cut, shaved along the sides. He had two scars across his cheek and a slight section of his right ear seemed to be missing. Hey boss, Blackman spoke up. Didn't know our newbie was showing up today. I did, the man in silver answered. Feeling the weight of awkwardness, the ensign hopped to attention. Spartan 422, Ensign Anna Barry reporting to Saber Team as ordered, she said formally which produced a chuckle from two of the Spartans. The silver-armored Spartan gave her a nod. Ensign, he acknowledged. I'm Tyson, Saber Team Commander. You'll be taking orders from me from here on out. Time for some introductions? He indicated the man working on the grenade. That's Logan, demolitionist. Don't let his gruff exterior fool you. Gooey like a cookie on the inside. <laughs> yeah, a big sweetheart, the black Spartan laughed. And that's Joker. Real name is Hardy, but he won't answer to that. His mouth works more than any other part of his body. Joker laughed at that, but Tyson just moved on to the aqua blue Spartan who hadn't spoken. That's Blue Jay. He'll answer to either name. He's quiet, but don't let that get to you. And then he finally indicated the girl next to him. And this is Volkova. You can call her Liz if it helps. Call me what you wish, she smirked, brushing back white hair. Her voice had a thick Russian accent, and Barry gave a polite nod to the room before taking a seat as Tyson turned back to the projector. Now that introductions are over with, let's go over the exercise tomorrow. Since our rookie wasn't supposed to arrive for another two days, we'll have to work her into the lineup. <laughs> Anyone feel like babysitting? Joker smirked. 
She can come with me, Liz encouraged. I can use a second pair of eyes. No, Tyson interrupted. So ride with Jay for this one. Jay glanced up from behind and gave another nod. Yes, sir, he acknowledged. Sorry for the inconvenience, Barry muttered. It's no trouble, Jay answered, glancing back. Tyson returned to the projection. To catch our newest up to speed, let's run over the exercise. Ever play Capture the Flag, Ensign? Yes, sir, Barry grinned behind her helmet. It's the same principle, but in this game, the enemy team is purely defensive. The local Marine garrison has set up a fortification for us to infiltrate, acquire a piece of intelligence, and then extract it out again. We'll be using non-lethal rounds and ordnance for this operation. Colonel Banks assures me that these men are his finest, so we have our work cut out for us. The team all shared a hum of amusement, which Barry tried to replicate. We've only been allowed outside images of the fort and an aerial map of the ravine. No internal scans allowed. That means once we're inside, it's an improvisation game from there. Hey, thinking on my feet's what I do best, Commander, Joker smirked. Interesting, and here I thought it was making a fool of yourself, Logan chimed in, ringing a giggle out of Liz. Joker shrugged. You mock what you can't touch, big guy. Lock it up. Joker and I will cover Logan as he plants explosives on the entryway. But that's the diversion we're going to create. While we draw the Marines' attention, Liz will take up a position on the eastern side of the ravine for a solid view of the east vantage point. Remove the lookouts there so that Jay and our new recruit can splice away in through that side of the fort. Once inside, Jay will signal me and we'll start to withdraw to regroup with you. And what happens if they don't fall for the bait, sir? Jay asked. <laughs> then that'll just make it easier for Logan to blow the front entrance. Either way, one of our teams is getting inside, if not both, Tyson replied. Once inside of Jay and the rookie get in place, proceed at your discretion to the fort, but stay low and focused. We don't know what they'll have done to the interior. What are our CQC parameters? Minimal. You might be, they might be mock enemies for the purpose of this exercise, but they're still Marines. We're not here to hurt them. <laughs> Permanently, anyway. I have a question, sir, Barry finally spoke up, fighting back the urge to raise her hand. I'm not familiar with any call signs or routines for this kind of operation, so Jay will bring you up to speed, Tyson remarked coldly, making Barry feel like she'd spoken out of turn. Jay nodded back at her before returning his focus to the briefing. Once the package is secure, do we have an evac route planned? Liz asked. No, without knowing the interior, we can't be sure of anything. But so long as Logan is in one piece, I bet he can make a nice door for us, wherever we are. Tyson turned his gaze at Logan, who gave a smile and reply. But I think that's enough for tonight. A lot of this has got to be played by ear anyway. Back to the barracks. We pull out at 0900. The Spartans all stood up and moved out of the room, casting glances back at Barry, who didn't move yet. She stood stock still and gulped a little as Tyson turned off the projector. He looked to see Barry still standing in the briefing room. Back to the barracks, he repeated. I don't know where they are, sir, Barry replied. Tyson sighed and sat down from his podium and walked towards her. I'll take you then, he replied. Barry winced at the, at the ice in his tone. Commander, she spoke up. What is it? He asked, pausing long enough to glare back at her through his scarred eye. It's nothing, sir. I just get the feeling you're not pleased with me. Did I speak out of turn earlier? No, you didn't, Tyson remarked. But if I'm being honest, Ensign, no, I'm not happy you're here. Barry stiffened as the commander rounded on her. Is there something wrong, sir? I didn't ask for a new recruit into Sabre. Nor was I given the chance to choose which Spartan was selected. Instead, I was told you were coming in two weeks, and I better make the necessary arrangements. Then I was sent your combat record, your training logs, and your overall performance file, Tyson snapped. And after reading over everything, I was duly impressed. You clearly have strong instincts, and you perform calmly under pressure. For someone fresh off Onyx, you don't see that too often. Then what's the matter? Until I had Jay contact a friend in Oni Intelligence Office, and I declassified all that black in your ledger. I read everything Intelligence didn't want me saying. Tyson sneered, causing Barry to go pale and stand at a rigid attention. And then that's when I suddenly realized you weren't an asset, you're a liability. Sir, I don't know what you read, but I can assure you that I... Jericho. The rigid attention got even more solid as Barry winced at the name. Sir, that was... I don't need the details and I don't need excuses, Spartan, he snapped. We're the elite because when push comes to shove, we shove back harder. When humanity is punched in the teeth, we're the boot that kicks back. We can't afford mistakes because when we make errors, lives are lost. I realize that, sir. Do you? He asked. Tyson looked her over a long moment before sighing and stepping back. I guess we'll just have to see about that. With all due respect, sir, Barry spoke up again, daring to challenge the commander. If I'm such an offense to you, why not just discharge me now? Send me back to Onyx. I was told that was my only other alternative. Commander Tyson shifted a little and looked back at Barry with a glare that was forceful and yet somehow sobered from a moment ago. Because you're not hopeless. Like I said, aside from the Jericho incident, you have a good record with an impressive file. You have potential. And I hate to see good potential wasted. 
Barry smiled a little at that, but then smothered it fast when Commander Tyson rounded on her. Thank you, sir. If there are no more questions, follow me. Tyson marched out of the meeting room and back into the hangar. The Pelican's engines were now off, and most of the soldiers were gone. The hangar felt large and somehow empty, despite the aircraft packed inside it. Barry kept close to Tyson as he marched, taking in the sights, the smells, the sounds of the evening. Tyson then pointed across from them about 70 meters to a large door. That door leads to the women's barracks. Volkov is already inside and can help you get settled. Report back to the hangar at 0900. We don't, wait, we don't do wake-up calls here, Ensign. I'm not going to come kick your ass out of bed. You're out here on time or you're left behind. Clear. Crystal clear. I'll double set my alarm clock. Or you could get that AI of yours to remind you, Tyson shrugged. Barry's smile vanished instantly as her eyes widened. Wiss was supposed to be classified. How had he known? Tyson, for the first time, gave a sly grin. Like I said, I read everything. I'd say he's got your number, lass, Wisk whispered into her earpiece. All right, lights out, soldier. Barry walked towards the door, leaving her fear and concern behind her as she hurried in. For a strange reason, Tyson made her feel uneasy. He not, only, he not only knew all about her background, but he also knew about Whisk. What else was he aware of? How much had he told the rest of the team? How much would she learn? Things were progressing in a manner she wasn't sure how to feel about. The barracks were large, clearly built for more soldiers, but the only other person in the barracks was Volkova, sitting on her bed and field-stripping her sniper rifle. She glanced up at Barry and gave a curt smile, returning her eyes to her weapon. Barry sat down on an empty bed near the door and stared at the hazy window that looked out at the aurora-filled sky. She rubbed her eyes and shook her head. The sound of the clicking, sliding, and clacking of gun parts was all she could hear. Try a, huh? It grows on you.